Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to this week's service. It's always a pleasure to worship God. We don't only worship God on Sundays, but every fiber of our being worships God. And in every day of our lives, in every activity that we get up to, we should always worship God. Join me as I light this candle. And we light this candle, continue, continuing to mention all our young people who are writing exams. And we continue to pray that may God's light shine upon them, that they shouldn't be consumed by fear and anxiety, but they should always know that God is alongside them and God will always be there. And let us pray together. Father, we thank you and we come before you, Lord God, because there is no other God that we can go to. We thank you for a beautiful and awesome God that you are. God who is gracious, God who is forgiving, and God who is loving. God who is loving even when we don't deserve to be loved. God who is gracious even when we deserve condemnation. God who forgives even before we ask for forgiveness. And so that's why we then come to you, Lord God, because you are an amazing God. And Heavenly Father, we also come to confess our sins since we commit against you, your creation, and other people, we pray that may your Holy Spirit guide us and help us to forgive other people as we have been forgiven. And also God give us strength and the spirit and wisdom to live in peace and in harmony with each other. We pray, Lord God, for those that are asking for your guidance. We pray for those that are confused. We pray for those that are grieving. We pray for those, Lord God, that continuously call unto you for help. We pray, Lord God, for the world. May your Holy Spirit come down, Lord God. We pray for those that are in leadership, in church spaces, and in secular spaces, Lord. May they always remember that they are leading your people. We pray, Lord God, for teachers, for parents, and we also pray for young people, Lord. We pray for children, Lord God that continue to suffer in the hands of adults in this society. We pray that it must come to an end, Heavenly Father, and we also pray that you protect children. We pray, Lord God, for those that do not have food. We pray for those that do not have shelter. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you open our eyes and ears to hear your people cry for help, to see your people suffering, so that we are moved with compassion, and we are led to help them. Heavenly Father, as we begin this service, may your Holy Spirit be with us, and may you move within us. And we pray this alongside the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying to them, this is how you should pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name and thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We now worship God in song.
Let us now turn to scripture and find the message for this morning. We find our reading from the book of Luke, chapter 23. We read from verse 33 to verse 43. The crucifixion of Jesus is the heading of the passage. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers, came, the soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered wine, vinegar, and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which reads, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there held <coughs> excuse me one of the criminals <coughs> excuse me one of the criminals who hung there held insults at him aren't you the messiah 
save yourself and save us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God? He said, since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. This is the word of God and thanks be to God. Friends, we find this reading from our lectionary. Lectionary is a document that guides us on readings that we need to read and preach on every Sunday. It is comprised of four messages or four texts, one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament, one in the Epistles, and one Psalm. Jesus Christ <clears throat> came to save the lost. Jesus Christ came to free us from bondage. Jesus Christ came so that people are freed from their sins. Jesus Christ came so that he who believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Jesus Christ came so that the relationship that was messed by a sin between God and his creation, human beings, should be restored. Jesus Christ came so that we are restored and justified by faith to go to the position in which God had created us. Let me then assume, my dear brothers and sisters in the Lord, that we all remember what happened leading to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Because this is what we engage on on Easter. These are the conversations we have in children's ministry. And so Jesus was led from the temple to Golgotha, the place called the skull for crucifixion. Jesus was not the first person to be crucified. It was a tradition that those who have been sentenced to crucifixion be crucified there. And so this is why when you read from the passage that we read, Jesus Christ is not alone on the cross. But there is a, a, a criminal on the left and there is a criminal on the right. And Jesus Christ is in the middle. And so Luke then says to us that when they came to the place of the skull, they crucified him there along with other criminals. And then At the cross, the first thing that Jesus does when he's at the cross is to offer a prayer to God even for the people who are crucifying him. Listen to him in verse 34 when he says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they are doing. And at this time, they are dividing his clothes and casting lots. So this then says to us that Jesus Christ, when he was at the cross, he was not fully clothed because the Bible then says they are using, they are dividing his clothes by casting lots. And so there was a crowd that was standing nearby watching. And this is the crowd, if you remember, my dear brother and my dear sister, who has been following Jesus Christ throughout his public ministry. You would remember that when he raised Lazarus, there was a crowd that was watching. You'd remember that when Jairus' daughter was sick, 
When Jesus said Talita kum, there was crowd following him. When the woman who was bleeding for 12 years was touching the garment of Christ, there was a crowd. Everything that Jesus did, he was followed by the crowd. You would remember that when he was entering Jerusalem, there was a crowd shouting, Hosanna, save us now. So everywhere that Jesus went, there was always a crowd that followed him. And so this crowd is standing there watching. Some believe that he was the Messiah. And up to this point, now they are wondering, is he really a Messiah if he doesn't save himself as he has always promised? Now you'd remember that these people were waiting for a Messiah, a Messiah that was going to rescue them from the oppression of the Roman government. They were waiting for a Messiah that was going to fight like soldiers of this world. They were waiting for a Messiah who was going to overthrow the government and they were set free. But then Jesus Christ is the Messiah, but the kingdom upside down. He is the Messiah that did not come to fight, but that came to suffer. He is the Messiah that came not only to free them from their political oppression, but from a spiritual oppression. And so, people then say, he saved others. Let him save himself. If indeed, because Jesus has been, it has been said that he was the Messiah. And these people have been waiting for a Messiah. Indeed, if he is the Messiah, let him prove himself. And so the soldiers then continue to mock Jesus. They offered wine. And they continue to say, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. But there was a notice written above Jesus that says this is the king of the Jews. When Jesus was born, the wise men from the east went to the palace of Herod and they said, we are here to worship the king of the Jews. And so Herod had a problem because he was a sitting king at the time. But then Jesus Christ has always been the king of the Jews. So now they are saying, if indeed he has a power, because they are used to kings that are born in the palace, they are used to kings that always are surrounded by army, if indeed he's the king of the Jews, why isn't he saving himself? And so let us focus on verse 38 for a little while. There was a notice written above him saying this is the king of the Jews. And the fact that Jesus is at the cross doesn't mean that he's not the king of the Jews. And so Jesus was king of the Jews. That's why he was born. He was born to be the Messiah. He was born to be the king of the Jews. The very same Jews that are crucifying him. And so Jesus Christ comes to fulfill the purpose of his life. And then I want us then to look at this, that Jesus Christ is not just the king of the Jews. He is the king of our lives. And it's one thing to know Jesus Christ as the son of the living God. But it's another to know him as the king of your life. And then you'd understand that when there is a king, the king needs to be worshipped. The king needs to be, the king needs to be worshipped, number one. And also number two, the king is someone who gives direction to the nation. The king also is feared and has to have a relationship with the subject. And so Jesus Christ is the king of our lives. He is the one that, sub, that is supposed to direct our lives. He is the one that is supposed to have throne and rule over our lives. And so I plead with you, brothers and sisters, that we go into a moment of reflection and wonder and ask ourselves, is Jesus king of our lives? And if the answer is yes, is there a sign from our day-to-day -day living that indeed we are the subjects of Jesus? Because the Bible always teaches us 
Not only to worship with our lips, but to also worship with our hearts. And when, when our hearts are transformed, our lifestyles are also transformed. Our, our tongue is also transformed. What we do, what we say, is a reflection of what God expects from us. So friends, we should not only say Jesus is the king of our lives, but we curse other people. We should not say Jesus is the king of our lives, and yet our lives are contrary to his beliefs. But when we say Jesus is the king of our lives, our lives, every day, we must strive to live like him. And we must listen to him when he says, the greatest commandment is to love God with all our mind, strength, and soul, and to love our neighbor. It is when we understand these two commandments that our lives are shaped by them. So it's not only about knowing, but it's also about living out. Bible scholars would always talk about the orthodoxy and the praxis, the belief and the action. And so I pray that we don't just believe, but our lives are also a reflection of what we believe in. And let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, giving our lives unto you, giving up who we are and taking everything that's you. Heavenly Father, remind us of that Methodist covenant prayer when we say, I am no longer mine but your own. When we say, put me where you want in suffering or in joy. Because these are the words, Lord God, of people who have given up themselves and followed you. You always, in scripture, call us to leave who we are, to follow you, and simply then to say, I, I am no longer my own but yours. Shape our lives, Heavenly Father. Speak to our hearts, Lord God, so that those who have not given up their lives can use this moment right now and say, I felt something in my heart move. And when my heart moved, something in me said, your sins have been forgiven. Something in me said, I am assuring you that God has taken away your sins. And something then gives an assurance that from now on, a, mo a turning moment has happened. So that when we stand, we stand in authority like John Wesley, whose heart was strangely warmed. Warm our hearts, Lord. Take away our sins, Lord. And forgive us, Lord God, for those moments we fall short of your glory. But in all this, embrace us, Lord God, with your love. So that when we look back, we realize that it's not us who carried ourselves, but it's your grace, O oh Lord. Be with us, Lord, as we head towards the end of the year. Protect us and remind us that you'll always love us. Be with us in the coming week, Lord God. Cover us with your love and with your grace. And as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, let's bless each other with the words of the benediction. And now, may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and evermore. Amen.